I'm uh, sorry about the slight change in the title that I've got listed. It was only at midnight last night that I noticed that the title I had given was Sin and Suffering in Julian of Norwich rather than Love and Suffering. But the, the content is the same, so don't worry too much about the title. Uh, I think it, it comes out about the same. Um, I want to begin on an autobiographical note. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Almost? No? Yeah. Okay. Um, at a bit of a tangent, to explain how I came to be thinking about this topic, um, and as a w in order to put it in a, in a broader context. There were a few years when uh, every year I was teaching Julian of Norwich to our first year undergraduates. And at the same time, I was writing a book on a theologian, not Rahner, who uh, my introducer mentioned, but a guy named Hans Urs von Balthasar. So my research was on Balthasar, and my teaching kept coming around to Julian. And Balthasar, I was writing a book on, this, this 20th century theologian, quite, quite an eminent guy, because I'd been reading him for a long time, and over the years I got quite troubled by him. And I got increasingly troubled, and eventually I decided to write a book where I tried to really understand him, but also articulate what bothered me about him. And I, I finally figured out, when I, when I proposed to the publisher, here's the book I want to write about Balthazar, I figured out what bothers me about Balthazar is that he seems to write as though he has a God's eye point of view, as though he has an overview of everything, and he's above everything, and he just tells us where everything is. And I happily set along the process of writing a book, which involves reading a lot more Balthazar and reading a lot of other people and trying to get it all into shape. And as I was doing this, I found that this thing which had always bothered me about Balthazar was only the first thing that bothered me about Balthazar. And I was <laughs> kind of surprised that something else leapt out of me about the, the atmosphere of Balthazar's writings, the, the atmosphere of his thought. And this was that he kept talking about suffering. Um, and he seemed to almost relish suffering, and he seemed to be going on and on about suffering. And I felt there was something almost a little bit, I wouldn't put this in print, don't quote me in print, but almost a bit sick, masochistic in it, in this, this emphasis on suffering, the way he came back to it. I was disturbed, and so I tried to think, what is it that's bothering me? After all, the cross is, is central in Christianity. Why should I object to him thinking about suffering? But there was something in the atmosphere of his work that seemed off to me. But at the same time as I was doing that, every year I was reading Julian of Norwich to talk to my students about. Um, and I noticed that she, too, talks an awful lot about suffering. Um, and in some ways, it's the same. There's a tremendous emphasis on suffering. She dwells on it a lot. She seeks suffering in a certain way. And yet, when I was in the world of Julian, each year as I came back reading it for my students, it was a completely different atmosphere. And it didn't disturb me at all. Um, and I found it a very positive and joyful atmosphere. So I thought, I started to think, how do these two fit together? They, they both put this great weight on suffering. Um, they both seem to have a kind of positive valuation of suffering, and that's what I thought bothered me about Balthazar, that he seemed to think that suffering was fundamentally good. And yet, it, it really didn't bother me in Julian. So I was wrestling with, how is it that Julian manages to bring together this, this, this great weight on sin and suffering, um, and this great sense of love and joy, and it works in her case, where something goes wrong in Balthazar's case. Now, since this is supposed to be a theology festival and not just a theology lecture, I'm leaving out the Balthazar side. I'm not telling you about the one that I don't like. <laughs> oh, you're all excited. <laughs> Sorry. Look. We can come back in questions to it if you like, or I might touch on it a little bit. But I thought I would dwell more on the figure whom I find very attractive, uh, who brings these things together in a, in, in a way that seems right and on target to me. But you can ask me afterwards. There'll definitely be time for questions afterwards, so you can come back to that. Um, now, from that bit of autobiography, if you're feeling sharp this morning, you will have realized I'm not a specialist. I'm not a medievalist. I don't spend all my time in the world of uh, women medieval mystical writers. Um, so I'm more of a theologian thinking with Julian and 
puzzling about themes in Julian than going to be the, the world's greatest expert on Julian. So I'm, I'm just quite interested. How many in the room have, um, have read some Julian before? Great. Um, and how many do you think probably know more about her than me? Are there any real de no, you know, <laughs> are there any real devotees who've, who've, who've written on her, spent a lot of effort? But you can speak up if you are in the audience and correct me or, or come into it. So my plan uh, today is to talk, first of all, about suffering and a bit about sin in Julian's thought. And then about the, the, the other side, the, the emphasis on love and joy and delight in God. And then to puzzle over how they relate in her thought and how it, it does seem to come out quite positively. But let me begin with a bit of, a bit of background on Julian herself, just to set the context. It seems like you are such a well-informed audience, you probably don't need it. But just for the one member who, who lacks any background, I will uh, say a little bit. She lived from, probably, from about 1342 until 1416. And, and during her later life, she was an anchoress in Norwich. How many people have visited her? Anybody visited her place? A few. Okay, so you can, you can go there. So being an anchoress means that she lived um, in, a, in a solitary way, in a, in a room attached to a church, sort of enclosed in a single room. It's an, it's an interesting thing to think about because when you, when you start to think about it, practically speaking, how do you get your food, how do you do your laundry, how do you go to the toilet? It, it's actually, for a community to support someone to be an anchoress takes quite a financial and communal commitment. You, you can't live like that with other, other people helping you make it possible, I suppose. Um, as far as we know, she was the first woman to write in English. We only know a very little bit about her, apart from what she tells us herself. Um, there's a reference to her in the writings of Marjorie Kemp, a mystic who visited her um, in about 1413. To, so Marjorie Kemp wanted, to, to, wanted Julian to kind of authenticate the, the, the um, reality of her own mystical experiences, which suggests that Julian was held in high regard already if someone would would come to her to do this. Um, one of the things that Julian said to Marjorie, according to what Marjorie records, is interesting. She said that, um, that Marjorie should measure her experiences, measure these experiences, according to the worship they accrue to God and the prophet to her fellow Christians. So this is a kind of principle. How do you, how do you judge a mystical experience? Look at how it makes you worship God how it makes you, how it benefits your, your other Christians. And, and the benefit to fellow Christians, the concern for fellow Christians is a very strong one in Julian in general. The only other uh, external piece of information we have about her, as far as I know, is that somebody talks about leaving money in their will for her support. Well, somebody's will um, includes this. Then we know what she herself tells us, which is not very much. Marjorie writes a kind of autobiography, but Julian really tells us very little about herself. And what she does tell us, um, there's questions about whether it's believable. So for instance, she says that she is only a simple, unlettered woman, that she, she claims to be an uneducated. And I don't think any scholars really believe that she was so uneducated, certainly not illiterate. Um, it may mean that she wasn't literate in Latin, or it may have just been a device to say, I'm humble, but I'm going to speak anyways. You can listen to me. So um, the main thing that we know about her is that around the age of 30, she experienced a series of visions. This is what she tells us. And that she spent much of the rest of her life reflecting on the visions, um, leaving us with two accounts of them, a shorter and a longer account, as most of you know, which is usually called the, translated the Revelations of Divine Love. The long version was written about 20 years after the short version. It's something like five times as long, and it's the one that I'll be mostly drawing on and referring to. Um, and th that's an important decision. I'll come back in a minute to why it's the long version that I'll be talking about. If you want to ask about the, the after effects of Julian, her reception, how she's been read and understood over the years, then I think you could encapsulate it by saying, in this realm, she's a late developer. Um, 
there's no evidence that anybody read her writing during her life, and it wasn't very influential for many years. She hasn't been one of the people that over the centuries uh, has been pretty consistently recognized as a major figure. It's only in the 20th century, as far as I understand, that she starts to get taken very seriously, and then she becomes very, very popular, as she is amongst us, obviously. Um, and at first she gets taken seriously as a great spiritual writer or a mystical writer. But the most recent phenomenon is that um, she's being taken quite seriously just as a straight theologian, as, as, as a major theological figure, a major theological thinker. So there's a very good book, sorry, I meant to put a slide on this, but by Dennis Turner called Julian of Norwich Theologian, which I'd recommend if you want to pursue some of these themes more. It's it's not exactly light reading, but it is interesting reading. Um, and I'm taking part in this recent trend. To me, she seems like a really, really fascinating theologian, just a really deep, intelligent thinker. Um, so that's a kind of choice of perspective that I'll be taking. I'm sorry to do so much of a preamble. I'll get on to the main thing in, in a couple minutes. But just to say something about reading Julian as a, as a theologian. You might think... She's a mystic. She's a visionary. What's really important is she had this amazing experience and she tells us about it and we should read it and pay attention. That would be another way to read her. Um, and if you read her that way, then you probably say we should look at the short text, the one that she wrote nearer the time, the one in which she just tells us what happened, what she saw, to get as close as we can to the authentic experience. Um, but the approach that I'm going to take is slightly different to say, let's look at her as a thinker, uh, which doesn't deny that she had an experience or that the experience was important, but we'll look at what she says as a whole and take her own reflections on the experience just as significantly as whatever it was that on those particular days where she was lying ill in her bed happened to her. Um, and we don't have to worry too much about you know, what might have been a definable experience at one point and what might have uh, emerged later in her thinking. Um, in fact, she doesn't make these distinctions herself very sharply. Well, I'll come back to that. Um, so on, on reading her as a theologian, you're as interested to see how she's wrestling with themes, how she comes back to them, how she herself is thinking through them as just what she says that God said to her or what she says that God showed to her and how she's weaving the material together. Now, you might think that I'm doing this because it's just professional bias. I'm a theologian. I want to read her as a theologian. And that's true to some degree. Um, you might think it says more about me as a reader than about her. But I just want to give you a couple of reasons why I would make the case for really reading Julian as a theologian. Um, first of all, something to do with the actual shape of, of the Christian faith. Are people getting too hot? Should we open the door again? So um, the, the basic shape of Christianity is that we have one revelation um, that we share that, that comes to us. Um, we don't keep on getting new little bits of revelation, I think. Um, and I say this as a Catholic theologian, even though I believe in tradition. But the way I would understand tradition is that it's not extra bits of things that, that suddenly drop out of the sky and add to the revelation that we already have but it's an ongoing process of interpretation, reception, reflection on this original revelation, which can, can guide us and our understanding of it can develop in important and irreversible ways. But it's not new dollops of what we got in the beginning, you might say. So the idea that there's something that's really key for Christians to know that was delivered as a revelation to Julian, a particular vision, and that that's what's really important, that makes me a little nervous uh, if you think this is how God's working, extra bits of revelation come along later in time. 
but if there is one revelation, then there's an ongoing process of trying to interpret it, of, of different ways of um, seeing the shape of it, of emphasizing it, of wrestling with it. This is the ongoing process of theology and tradition. And I'd see Julian principally within that process. And whatever her vision was, it helped her to, uh, to become another moment in this tradition of the reception of revelation, something like that. She's a, she's a theologian wrestling with what's given to us all rather than a new source. Um, and the short text itself, it, it, it would, if you wanted to say, just look at her as a visionary, it'd be hard to get back to what the vision was. Um, and she herself blurs the lines incredibly. She talks about what she sees, but sometimes she sees it in her understanding. And it's really what she understands, what she comes to, the ideas that she comes to. And she treats it all perfectly legitimately as a gift of God. God let her see that, and it will be a kind of theological conclusion. So to me, it seems that it's more a, a way to take Julian more seriously, to treat her as, a, as, as principally a theologian, look at the whole of what she writes and treat it as all important. And my final reason for doing that is it seems to me that if you do that, she's just a really, really good theologian. I would say that she's the, the best theologian that the English language has. Um, I thought about saying that, and I felt a little bit guilty towards John Henry Newman, and I thought, am I really going to say Julian beats poor old... Newman. But I think she's, she's probably more of a theologian than he is. Newman is, is kind of philosophical and he's kind of um, thinking about the abstract issues that lie behind theology, like under what conditions should give you, you give your assent to a belief, or how does development of doctrine work. But Julian is dead center talking about things that are absolutely central to the faith. So she describes herself as unlettered, um, but there seems a lot of evidence that she knows the theological tradition very well and that she's sitting within it, that she knows Augustine and a lot that followed from Augustine very well. There's lots of echoes and use of different material. But she's a, she's a really powerful theologian because she, she takes this material and she, um, it comes out in her thought in a, in a very different voice, in a very distinctive style. She's very hard to place. And sometimes... She follows the logic of the position of the tradition further than the tradition takes it. She kind of carries through on the instincts of the tradition in, in, with a kind of novelty, but a kind of sure touch, I think, that is very impressive. And I'll come back to that when we talk about God's anger. Um, so it's quite an unusual text, um, Julian's text. It's, it's got a kind of immediacy and a directness to it, a freshness to it in her writing. Um, and it's got this real intellectual depth to it at the same time. It's very hard to place it. It's kind of unique. It doesn't fit in any theological genre very easily. It's not like a piece of scholastic theology that someone like Aquinas might have produced. And yet it's got the kind of intellectual rigor and the, the wrestling with questions that you might get in Aquinas. Um, and something that's very... This is my last preliminary. I'm making too many preliminary comments. Last comment. Something that's very interesting about it especially given the time it's written at, it's directed to all her fellow Christians. Um, this really makes it stand out from other texts of the period because normally you would make a distinction between those who had taken the evangelical vows, the people who were in religious life and taken vows of poverty, chastity, and celibacy, and the lay people. She, makes, she seems not to even know that distinction. She doesn't mention it. It's just written for all fellow Christians. It's not... It's, it's focused on a vision that she had, but it's always pointing outwards. This is meant for everybody. Uh, this is nothing special about me. When God says this to me, he means it to be said for everybody. So it's got this unusual universal appeal to it. Okay, so, so much for my preliminary comments. Let me turn now to um, this thing about suffering. It seems to me if you start reading Julian of Norwich from the beginning of the text, you, you cannot miss her emphasis on suffering. It's unmissable. And in fact, while I say that it was quite important to me year after year to be reading Julian with my students, they very often never were able to get beyond the emphasis on suffering. So it did me a lot of good to read Julian. It didn't do my students too much good. They, could, they just said, ugh, um, <laughs> more or less. So let's look at some examples. She begins with a prayer for three gifts. Um, she wants to perceive Christ's passion vividly. 
She wants to have a bodily sickness while still in her youth. She prays to, to, to fall sick. And, well, let me talk about the sickness. She, well, maybe we'll come back to that. She really wants to, to be on the point of death, to believe that she's going to die, to go through all the suffering that she would have when she dies. She just comes right out at the beginning. My students are really very puzzled by this. Um, <laughs> And then she prays for uh, three wounds of contrition, compassion, and earnest longing for God. Um, the, the business of praying to, to go through these experiences, one year I had a mature student in my class who'd been a psychiatric nurse, and she just said, oh, she'd be sectioned nowadays. You know, this is just, this is just loony. So it's really very striking and something we're, these days anyways, not very used to, that, that you would desire pray directly, your, your firmest prayer would be to have all this suffering and sharing in Christ's passion. And she prays for this stronger experience of the passion because she says that she could, she could feel the passion of Christ to some extent, but she wanted to feel it more strongly. So as an ordinary Christian, she could feel it, but she wanted to have a stronger feeling of it. She wanted to be there. She wanted to be there with Mary Magdalene and she wanted to be shown him in the flesh so that she would have more knowledge of Jesus' bodily suffering and of the Virgin Mary's fellow suffering and of the suffering of all of his true friends who saw his pain. She wanted to be one of them and to suffer with them. So she, she wants vivid um, sense of what's going on. She asked for the experience of dying she wants to be so sure that she's dying that she's going to receive all the last rites, that she's going to believe she's dying. She wants to have every kind of suffering in body and soul that she would have experienced if she'd died, even the terror of the fiends. That's interesting. So that's what she prayed for, and then her prayer was granted. When she was 30, she did indeed fall ill. She forgot that she had done the prayer, so she really thought she was dying. And then eventually, um, at a key moment, she begins to have her visions when she's on the point of death and looking at the, the crucifix. And some of these visions are really quite gory. They're quite graphic. Um, she saw the red blood. She has a vision, quite a long extended vision of Jesus bleeding from the crown of thorns. And she goes on at some length about the blood. I saw the red blood trickling down, trickling down from under the crown of thorns, hot and fresh and very plentiful. She sees it as though it were the moment of the passion when the crown was thrust on his blessed head. And she emphasizes just how much blood she saw. Uh, this is no longer the crown of thorns, I guess, but Christ's body as a whole from being whipped. She emphasizes the brokenness of the skin. It was all covered with blood. I, you can feel for my students. Um, and then there's this long passage on the drying out of Christ, um, that he's thirsty, that he's blown by the winds, um, that he's bleeding, and that he's getting very, very dry. Uh, his, it's... it's it's a little bit gory, as I say. The blasts of winds, the cold are coming together. Uh, so she's describing in great detail all the things, the loss of blood and the pain, all the things that are drying Christ out, bit by bit, dying with amazing agony. So a fair bit of um, concreteness to... Uh, yep. That's it for my examples of her emphasis on suffering. She presumes, so, 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 so there's, this, there's this focus on Christ's suffering, uh, a, a fair dwelling on it to a certain degree, a, a desire to experience it, to feel it, to feel what it would be like to be one of those watching it. Um, and then there's also quite an assumption that our life is marked by suffering. But the main kind of suffering that she thinks our life is marked by is suffering caused by sin. She, she, it's very interesting the way she collapses sin and suffering in our life um, and the way she sees them collapsed in God's eyes. Um, 
But the, the presence of sin in our lives, the fact that none of us can escape sin, that God allowed sin into the world, is the thing that troubles her the most, and she circles back to it repeatedly. Um, so that's one side of Julian. It's definitely there. You meet it. It's, it's, it's strange. You wonder what's going on. There may be other things going on in, in some of those images. So the thirst of Christ the, the drying out of Christ, probably connected to um, Christ's desire for us. His thirst comes up in other ways that he longs for us. He has a love longing for us. The, um, the blood of Christ, probably also seen as redemptive. So she's, probably even when she's at her most gory, it's not just for the sake of being gory. There's probably always other themes going on there, but it's quite striking. So I want to leave behind suffering for a moment and then turn to her sort of tremendous emphasis and, and the way she talks about the love of God, which is, I think, what my students failed to see and so didn't get a really strong sense of her. She has, um, to my mind, she comes across as, in spite of all that I've talked about, as one of the most relentlessly positive um, theologians that I know of. Uh, with with one of the strongest emphasis on on the love of God, on the joy, delight, desire for us of God, on the bliss of God. And there's, I was trying to think how how does she make this impression on me? And I've come up with a, a, a few ways. And one is the kind of language she uses. This very skillfully uses language about the love of God. And I think it's a it's a kind of combination. Her way of talking about the love of God is a combination of very. Um, domestic language of the family and intimacy and courtly language of, of the, the courteousness. And, and she brings these together in quite a positive and powerful way. So some examples. Here we have an example that actually comes just when she'd been doing all that talking about the blood and that she'd been seeing all this blood. And then what she says she understood by it um, is how comforting it was that God is also, who is so awe-inspiring, is also so familiar and courteous to us. She says that God showed her an example of how a, a king or a lord can show respect to a humble subject um, by being very intimate and friendly with them. So that the poor man thinks, ah, how could this noble Lord give me more respect than, respect than by treating me, who am humble, with this marvelous respect. So right in the midst of looking at the blood, she's talking about a kind of courteous and friendliness of Christ. And the, the drama of how he who is the highest is the most kind and friendly. So... The contrast between divinity and humanity in Christ is, of course, been there in the whole tradition. But her way of describing it is, I think, um, brings it home in a very particular kind of earthy and intimate way. Her way of talking about the, 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 the impact of the incarnation. She talks about God... Um, this comes in her sixth revelation where she's talking about God's gratitude that he shows to souls in heaven who are saved and compares him to the Lord who reigns, who's invited all his beloved servants to a solemn feast, who fills it with joy and heart, gladdening and comforting his friends familiarly and courteously um, with a marvelous melody of endless love in his own fair blessed face. She emphasizes Christ's delight in us. Christ says, It's a joy, a delight, and an endless happiness to me that I ever endured suffering for you. She talks about us as his joy, his reward, and his glory. So th this sort of rich combination of language about the way, the way in which God loves us, the kind of ways in which God's love is described in terms of language of courtesy, um, and family love and intimacy is, is, is quite powerful, I think. Um, a, second, a second thing that makes her vision so positive uh, 
I think, is this notion that there is no anger in God. Um, it's one of her most striking theological claims, I think. And she says this is something she saw in her visions or in her revelation. She never saw any anger in God. She could see no blame and no anger in God. We do many evil things which we oughtn't to do. We leave undone many good deeds which we ought to do. Um, and we deserve punishment and anger. And in spite of all this, I saw that our Lord was never angry and never will be angry. And she comes back repeatedly to the theme that there is no anger in God. No anger, not even forgiveness, because there isn't the moment of anger to forgive in God. So she says she wondered what mercy and forgiveness of God really is. So she thought that mercy must be, first God is angry, then he decides not to be angry with us, he has mercy. But she, however hard she looks, she can't see this anywhere in the whole showing. She couldn't see anger for sin. The only anger she sees is on the human side, and God forgives us for our anger. Or the effect of mercy is to lessen, not to lessen God's anger, but to lessen our anger. We may feel angry and contentious, but we're enclosed in the mercy and goodness of God. So this, I think, is, is something of an innovation, to be so insistent um, that there can't be anything like anger in God. Certainly I've not seen it in, in any of her predecessors cast in this light, but it's, it, this is a point at which it seems to me she's being very, very faithful to the tradition, even if she's pushing it a step further because she's picking up partly on ideas of the eternity of God. God doesn't change. God isn't in time that he could swing around on his emotions. Um, the simplicity of God that she presents God as having a single attitude towards us, not um, um, like wrestling between um, m multiple different stances towards us, which you can sometimes feel is what you're getting in, in some theories of the atonement where... Uh, you know, because, you know, God solves a problem in this way and because Christ does this, then he sets aside what we would have been owed. And Julian really very steadily depicts a single attitude of God towards at least souls who are saved. And she doesn't talk too much about anyone else and says she can't see anyone else. But towards souls who are saved, there's always nothing but this compassion, this pity, this desire, joy, courteousness. Um... So there's an utter absence of blame and reproach in the way that God talks to the soul. Uh, so here I think you have not just something quite nice that Julian says, God isn't angry, but something that is a very integral development out of the tradition that she's coming from, which, which goes back to the fathers and Augustine and so on, but where she's seeing more clearly and articulating more clearly than anyone else has a consequence. It just doesn't make sense to imagine anger in God. And at one point she says, she, she realizes that if God were angry, the world, even for a moment, even a little bit, the world would cease to exist because the world is upheld by God's love. So how can you think in terms of this love being mixed with anger? It would simply go out of existence. Um, to me, that seems like a really strong theological point that she's seeing in her visions that she's making that has, a, has is not, it's, it's new, but it's traditional at the same time. And I think one way in which she fleshes that out um, and develops it is in her famous um, parable of the Lord and the servant. How many, since you've nearly all read this, how many can actually remember this parable? I don't know. Oh, good, at least I can tell you something you're not all remembering. Um, this, is, this comes quite late in, in the book. Definitely my students, the reason my students are so, it was a, I should tell you, you'll think we're terrible teachers if I let my students misunderstand it year after year. It was a particular course that was designed to just put them in front of primary texts and see what they could make of it. So I didn't have a chance to frame it very well for them. They would always get discouraged before they got in about chapter 50 to the parable of the Lord and the servant. And I think it's a real theological pinnacle of Julian's work. Um, so it starts this way. She sees, she has a vision of a Lord and a servant. So you have the Lord who's sitting in a dignified, calm way, well-dressed, servant standing nearby, eager to do his will, not so well-dressed. 
the Lord asks the servant to go and do something for him, and the servant eagerly runs off and does it, and immediately falls into a pit, and is hurt, and can't get out. And that's the vision she sees. And while the servant is moaning and groaning in the pit, the Lord is continuing to look in a kindly way at the servant. And she puzzles for nearly 20 years about what this means, because she assumes that the servant is Adam, and the Lord is God, and she's seeing the fall of Adam. Um, but she can't really make sense of the whole thing, and there's some things that don't fit there. And what she eventually realizes is that um, it's a vision simultaneously of the fall of Adam and the incarnation of Christ. So the servant is both Adam falling into the ditch, and it's Christ falling into the virgin's womb. And the two things are seen together, and God looks at them with a single vision. The, the Lord sees, doesn't see anything to blame in the servant. So let me see if I have. So when Adam fell, God's son fell. Because of the union of Christ and Adam in heaven, God's son couldn't leave Adam. So Adam falls from life to death, and God's son falls into the womb. So, well, same sort of theme. Um, the situation that she describes the servant in when the servant falls is that they're, they're damaged by the fall, they're stuck in the pit the servant is. He groans and moans and wails and writhes, but he can't get up or help himself in any way. Um, and he can't turn to look at the Lord because he's stuck in the pit. Um, and he's even stunned by his fall so that he forgets that he was out on a mission for his Lord. He forgets, almost forgets his love for his Lord. Um, but all the while, the Lord looks at the servant with sorrow and pity because he's suffering. But at the same time, she says, and much more so, the Lord looks at the servant inwardly rejoicing because the Lord knows the good things the Lord is going to do for the servant, which are going to so far surpass the suffering that the servant is currently going through in the pit. So this is a kind of conflated theological vision here, where you see everything that's wrong with the world and its redemption in a single in a single vision. And this is kind of a way of saying God never has a chance to be angry because he never sees sin without already seeing it redeemed, without already seeing Christ being united with humanity. So that there is never any blame because the redemption is, is already there from the beginning. Um, So that, again, that seems to me um, a powerfully positive way of looking at God's relation to the world, I suppose, God's relation to sin, a powerfully positive way of looking at redemption. Um, and my last, my last bit of evidence of this, well, God comforts and grieves, never blames and punishes. The perhaps the most famous line that Julian is summed up by, and all should be well, and all should be well, and all manner of things should be well. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's one of the most purely positive uh, articulations of a Christian vision that we have in the tradition, it seems to me. So in this one text, in this one thinker, if I now try to draw the two sides together, on the one hand, we have this dwelling on suffering, certainly on Christ's suffering. We have a, her describing her life that's shaped by a desire to feel death, to experience more suffering. And on the other hand, we have this most uninhibited, positive presentation of the love and kindness of God. So how, how to think about these two things together? That's the question I've been wrestling with. Um, now, my first hypothesis um, the first, maybe what you think would be the a obvious answer is, well, you have to remember when she lived. She was just a very positive person who lived at a time of great darkness when, when people tended to dwell on suffering. So you might say it's because of her context that she has all this blood and desire to feel death, but it's because of her originality that she's got a positive vision. And there's some, there's some truth in that. It's certainly true that this emphasis on dwelling on 
the passion on the suffering of Christ that comes at a particular point in the tradition. It hasn't always been there. It's at a kind of high point in the late Middle Ages. Um, at earlier stages, you might only dwell on Christ as victorious, the feeder of evil, not someone who's suffering intensely. And some scholars point to the fact that at certain places, Julian starts with a very, for her time, a very conventional description of her visions of um, Christ's wounds or Christ's blood. So she starts off just as you'd expect a woman mystic to do, and then she pivots and goes in an unexpected direction where she becomes much more abstract and theoretical. So maybe she's playing with the conventions of her time. Some people have sort of <coughs> suggested that. But I don't think it works to say all this emphasis on suffering is just a matter of her time, and the true Julian is just the, the purely positive one. It seems to me that it runs right through her writings that she does presume that Christ's suffering is key. It's the one aspect of his incarnate life that she dwells on. Um, she really has to emphasize the, the magnitude of Christ's pain and suffering that is beyond all other pain. Um, it's important in her thought has something to do with the magnitude of redemption, or at least that it expresses, it needs to be greater than all other pain and expresses something of the magnitude of Christ's love. And as I said before, a theme that she's always wrestling with is why is sin necessary? Um, it's an absolutely central theme. She's really, because she's not just a kind of vaguely optimistic, happy person. She's really theologically wrestling, I think, in the Revelations with the question, why does God allow there to be sin in the first place? She says, sin is the sharpest scourge that any chosen soul can be struck with. She comes back to it again and again. Um, she tells us that she thought that if sin had never existed, everything would have been fine. We'd have all been pure like God himself. And so she often wondered, had wondered before her visions, why, in his great foreseeing wisdom, God had not prevented the beginning of sin. For then I thought all would have been well. And she says she grieved and sorrowed over the question. She says that this was folly on her part to say, why did God ever allow sin to come to be? But nevertheless, she um, keeps coming back to the issue. So at one point... At one point, she um, she has the Lord assuring her that Christ will take away all blame from our sin, for our sins, and treat us with compassion and pity as though we're innocent children. And then the very next chapter, she can't let the issue rest. She says, but I paused at this, sad and grieving, and in my thought I said to our Lord, oh my good Lord, how could all be well, given the great harm that has been done to humankind by sin? So she's not just accepting everything's fine, she's saying, but how could it be? How could you have allowed sin? How can all be well when we've had such a thing as sin? Um, so I think structurally, she really does have an important place for Christ's suffering in her thought. There really is an emphasis on her worry about where sin comes from. And I also think that if you read her as, as, as it's only a matter of her time that there's anything about sin and suffering in there, then you get a kind of really treacly um, Julian, a kind of shallow one. I think that her emphasis on love and joy probably carries some weight because they come through in the midst of a real encounter and grappling with suffering and evil. And sometimes when she's quoted out of context, you mix that, you miss that. So, so my assumption is that the, both these elements really are Julian. It's not that one is the Middle Ages and one is Julian. They're, they're both there in her thought. And the question is, how do they go together? Here's where it gets interesting, I think, because there's, there's two points at which you might expect someone could try to work out how these things go together. Um, two questions. One is the one I was just talking about. Why does God allow evil in the first place? You can say God's goodness, existence of sin and evil and suffering in the world, why is it allowed at all? That's one place where you might wrestle with these two sides. And the other place is um, the atonement. How is it that the suffering that Christ goes through that she puts such great emphasis on how does that actually bring about anything good? What's so good about the suffering? How does Christ save? What's the mechanism? These are the two places where you might think she gives some answer to how the two sides fit together. But in fact, at this point, 
Um, at, at both these points, I think she wrestles with the problems, but she leads us further away from an answer rather than towards an answer. So I'm just going to very quickly give an example of that. So with the atonement, I, I've touched on this, this emphasis that God isn't angry. It's really destroying, coming pretty close to destroying how she's going to account for how all the suffering of Christ is going to help. Because it's not that God was demanding something. There isn't a moment when God is angry and only Christ's suffering makes God unangry. She, she sort of says that's how she assumed it would work, but it doesn't. And she doesn't provide a different explanation. The, the parable of the Lord and the servant is the closest she comes, but that's not really an explanation of how this sin and suffering and God's goodness and joy fit together. It's more just a presentation of it. Um, she also doesn't ever give an answer to the question, why did God allow sin? She says she was wrong to ask it, and that God assures her that all should be well. Um, but she gives no solution, why did a good God allow sin? And it's not because we might say, well, he wanted to allow freedom, so he had to allow sin. She wouldn't say that. She presumes that God is so intimately evolved in creation that all our freedom is actually also an expression of, of anything that we do is also what God does, except for sin. But she has no account of where sin would come from. So she... God tells her sin is befitting and then says all should be well and all should be well. But God doesn't say how sin is befitting. Sin is somehow appropriate. It fits into the scheme of things. There's something right about it. God affirms that, but he doesn't explain it in her, in her vision. And she doesn't come up with an explanation. She wrestles, she circles, but she doesn't answer. Um, so you might think that I'm, I had said I think she's a really good theologian. Now I'm saying, well, she's not such a good theologian after all because she leaves us with answers, without ans questions and no answers. But actually, I think this is one of the reasons that she is such a good theologian. I think that the deepest theology is often about blocking our desire to settle on answers that don't actually work. Um, most times when people come up with a theory of the atonement or an explanation for the problem of evil, they always do it at a cost, leaving a slightly bad taste in your mouth. You wind up with uh, saying that evil is not really evil and that's why it was all right, you know, the suffering is okay as long as it's for a greater good. Or you wind up saying that um, God somehow demands his amount of blood to be kept happy. When most of the theological explanations that people put forward to bring these things together, in one way or another, not only do they not quite work, but they somehow either diminish the reality of our experience of evil, or they um, diminish God in some way. So what I would say is that Julian has a particularly beautiful way, not of offering an explanation of the relation of love and suffering, but of holding them together in an effective way, holding the light and the dark together. Um, just as she holds in that parable, the fall and the redemption are held together. Um, she doesn't smudge, and this is where she's different from Balthazar, she doesn't smudge them together so that really if you look hard enough at suffering, it is love. Really, suffering is good at its ultimate level. Ultimately, the goal is joy, and that's nothing to do with suffering. But she holds them together in our experience, um, and it seems to me that she can more persuasively talk about <coughs> the light, the joy, the goodness, the love of God, because she's not talking about it in a way that's ignoring the suffering, um, the, and it's mag the magnitude of sin, but somehow in the midst of it, she can, this is something she can still affirm without explanation. So I'm particularly bad at ending talks, I realize lately. I tend to end on a fizzle. So I started this time, I would end the talk with the beginning of another talk I have to do next week, because I decided that ultimately these two talks are on the same thing. So next week, um, no, that's not it. Next week I have to talk about um, Evangelii Gaudium and the question of how the Pope, I think they have a similar pattern here, how the Pope has two emphases in this document. One is that the, is on poverty. The church is, is a church of the poor, and for the poor, we, we, have to, we have to look at everything that's wrong, we have to get out and get dirty, we have to um, 
we have to pay really serious attention to the worst things that are going on in the world, and that's very close to the essence of what the church is. And at the same time, there's this tremendous emphasis on joy in the Pope's, um, in the Pope's writing, in the Pope's person. So how does he bring together a church that makes poverty its absolute center and a church that's um, taken up in the, into the great stream of joy? He talks about, can we not enter the stream of joy that we see in Scripture? And to me, that's the same, that's the same thing as, as going on in Julian, that um, both of them exhibit the kind of Christian faith that has to be able to do justice both to Good Friday and to Easter Sunday. It has to look at and not run away from sin and suffering and the brokenness of things. It has to really look at this, and yet it has to be centered on something joyous. Um, and ultimately, I think that that's something that can only be lived out rather than theorized. It can be exhibited but not explained. Um, so there, that's my ending. Uh, so do you want to take a minute or two to talk amongst yourselves and then see if you have any questions or comments? Uh, questions or comments that they want to make? Um, what I can't understand is why wouldn't she take them more seriously earlier on in her life and why did she not influence um, Catholic theology really from the time she died to right up to the Until the century? Being the last century. <laughs> so I mean, I'll 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 make a stab at answering that, but I have to say that I'm not an intellectual historian, so it's just an amateurish stab. But so people have immediately said because she's a woman, and I think that's certainly an element of it. You can also say she wasn't writing in Latin; um, she wasn't writing within um, a school or a tradition of thought. You know, she just stands out so much. It's one the thing that makes her speak so freshly to us made her somehow disconnected from what was going on around, I think. Um, so she is an unusual figure in that she doesn't slot neatly into, you know. So if, if somebody comes and, and submits some work to me in the university context and they haven't followed any of the normal procedures. It can be quite hard for me to judge. I mean, this is putting a nice view on the tradition. There is certainly also an element just that she was outside the structures, outside the power, she had wrong gender, and so on. But she, yeah. Somebody else may have a better answer no, to the question. The, the, the male mystics of that period haven't, haven't done too much more. The yeah. Tradition either, have they? So. Um, yeah. Do, yeah. But it's, it, it's from then. Yeah. The church gets quite edgy about people who are on the edge of it, don't we? Yeah. You know, I mean, anybody who's on the edge is a bit kind of. Yeah. You know, the church gets quite yeah. nervous yeah. about them, and, yeah. and and so you want to contain them. I mean, in the hermit thing yesterday, the Desert Fathers, they they were kind of drawn in because of the desire to just keep them in the box. Yeah. Know? Because people would what? stop people going to them. And, yeah. Um, and uh, she probably hadn't got a good marketing purse. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no printing. Yeah. No yeah. Printing. Why did so she want done. to write it all down anyway? I mean, to me, it looks like she's struggling. She's she's thinking about serious questions, and writing is a way of thinking. It's a way of developing your thinking. It's a way of recording your thinking. To me, that. If you're, if you're walled up in a monastery, yeah, she you must. Can't see the point of writing. Well, she she clearly thought that it completely detached. Deta from the world. Yeah. Oh, she clearly did want people to know about it. I think so. She wasn't detached for the sake of not caring about the world, presumably, but to live out a particular vocation. But there's clearly a very strong concern that her understanding should be communicated eventually to her fellow Christians. Uh, People came to consult her. Yeah. 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 So it's not an absolute cutting off. Do we know we've got the entire work or could there be endings that have got lost? Or, you know? I don't know. I haven't seen suggestions that there are missing bits, but 
I'm not a textual it's a long specialist. Time ago, isn't yeah, it? yeah. How did you never get saved? I don't. I mean, I just hear she is in this room, but that writing away. So I don't think she's. Died, yeah. Well, I mean, as I say, if you think about how do you live in a room, you need food, you need water, um, you need fuel to keep warm. So. She's, she's living in a room, but she's not cut off. They know she's there. There are There's a support network. There are people who are concerned and probably who have a very high opinion of her who, so who might be looking into what, is, what they find when she dies and copying it enough so that it stays alive until, until the 20th century when it gets picked up, so not completely ignored. Would she have been under the patronage of the bishop? I think so, yeah. So She'd have needed the permission of the bishop. On the, on the yeah. Church, yeah. yeah. Church, yeah. 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 <coughs> Connection? I think so. Um, I mean, she looked principally at Christ's suffering, but when she thinks about sin, I think for, for in, her, in her vision, sin is our principal form of suffering. Now, we, we might now think... We, I, I don't know if I would want to spin it quite that way, that sin was our only form of suffering, or even the principal one but one of them. But I, I think there is a connection between... Um, I mean, I don't know how to articulate it fully except to say that the intuition I have behind what Pope Francis says is that our true joy doesn't come from blocking ourselves off from the darkness, the, the suffering of other people, from other people, um, or from, you know, just thinking about Christ in purely happy terms and forgetting about Good Friday, but that The Christian pattern is that the you know you really encounter the love of God the more you're willing to really look at Christ's suffering or in, for her or for us maybe other people's other people's suffering. Yeah. I mean. Of sin, that's true, yeah, so it's connected that way as well, yeah. We, we regard sin very personally, don't we? It's kind of more personal. Where I, I get a feeling that in Evangelii Gaudium, the Pope talks about sin as a, as a corporate thing. Yes, so, where, okay, where, so, where, where, yes. You know, and we, you know, it is a sin that people starve to Right, death. right. Yeah. And, and the sin then may be the absence. Yes, so, so, so you could say, looked at in that way, then there is a real parallel that both of them are saying, go to sin, look at it, dwell on it. You don't have a solution to it necessarily, but um, that's where you live your Christian life, by actually facing it. Yeah, mm-hmm. so thank you for that. Well, think, that sort of what you're saying, sin, it's difficult for us in the terminology to think of sin as a form of suffering or our worst suffering. But I think there is a point that sin is the worst thing that can happen. Yeah, us. yeah. And if we, if we forget, if we don't have that, we don't realize that sin is worse for us than suffering. Uh-huh. We can go off on the wrong yeah. path yeah. and try to minimize, yeah. try to think the most important thing we should do for everyone is to minimize suffering. Right. Rather than the most important thing we should do is to avoid sin. Ten, yeah. But how did she sin? when she was inside her cell, and yet she asked to suffer. She didn't ask to sin. No, but she, she presumes that nobody can get through life without sinning. Well, how uh, did she manage to do that? Did well, presumably in, her th- presumably in her thoughts, you know, in, in her attitudes and so on. Did you mention at the beginning the start of the dates she lived? Yes, it's sort of end of 13th, beginning of... Uh, end of 1300s, beginning of 1400s. Yeah, so this is just after yeah. So there was an awful lot of black uh, black, the black death. Yeah. And there are all the decorations and churches and that were very heavily involved with sin and death. So yes. The general atmosphere. Yes, exactly. And and so in a way, the fact that you know, although I started with the kind of gory side of her, 
the, 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 the main, if you just read along and allow yourself to be carried by it, it is an extremely positive vision. And what you can say is that it's, it's against this very black background. She thinks that what we really need to remember... So she, she presumes that in all our lives will be an awareness of sin, which probably culturally would be stronger then than it is now, an awareness of individual sin. And there's more than enough suffering. Um, and that she presumes that these will be affecting us and we'll, we'll always be aware of them. But we, what we should princi- principally focus on is um, the kind of the wonders of God's love rather than being... She, I, I had a phrase that I was meaning to quote and didn't about... God not wanting us to go through life um, with um, yeah, with unreasonable depression and unprofitable misery. So the, God is telling us, don't unreasonably dwell on your own the misery of your own sin and suffering in general. Did you were yeah. Been yeah. 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 Yeah, so I think you have that here. Yeah, and so I mean, one danger of the way Julian might sometimes be read nowadays is that if, at least, you know, not the world as a whole, but if we live in a little enclave where we aren't experiencing anything like the Black Death um, and we don't have a very heavy view of sin, then we just so you know, if my life is really easy, which it is on the whole, and then I just say, oh, isn't this nice? She's just telling me it's all about joy and not to worry too much but I wasn't worried too much so she could get misappropriated if we think she's just pure optimism and there's no there's no there's nothing there's no backdrop to it but it's quite important that the optimism is against being very aware of the darkness yeah can you just follow that up with by thinking about that extraordinary prayer um to be sick and die <laughs> I mean you say no wonder your, your, your students are, are baffled but to try and make sense of that does, I can't remember. Does she? Does she actually make the step which might make sense of it, which would be to say, because then I'll be able to be more compassionate. Does she? Do, she. That she seems to be yeah. The only thing I can yeah. See to. I was. I was. At one year, I really tried to make the case to my students of why that, that particular bit, why they, how they could understand it. She doesn't. She doesn't herself say because, although she does pray to be more compassionate. It's the th- part of the third thing that she asked for, um, the wound. I think, you know, my students will sometimes um, do live below the line for a week where they live on a pound a week. And I had um, a pound a day to, you know, to in solidarity. And I had one student who said to make it a bit more interesting, he was going to have to use his pound for both food and transport. And he wasn't going to let himself um, carry money over from one day to the next, just really just live on a pound a day. And this guy was very thin to start with. So I started getting worried about how he was going to survive. Um <laughs> And therefore, it made his sense of solidarity with the poor seem a little more real to me. If he was trying to actually have a bit of an experience that would put him in some touch with what people had actually gone through. So what I think for her maybe is to feel the experience of dying and to and it's connected to wanting to um, to wanting to feel the passion more. It's I, Christ loved me so much. He went through this. I want to come as close as I can to to feeling what that's all about, so I'll have some understanding of the love that's involved, maybe. As, and, and then that will lead to compassion for everyone else, something, something like that. But it's extraordinary because she doesn't f- seem to feel that she needs to explain why she would pray for such things, which may be a cultural gap between her and us. Does she explicitly identify the sufferings of, say, the sick or her fellow Christians with the sufferings of Christ? Would she use the motive of seeing Christ in the sufferer? She talks not not she talks about us joining our sufferings to Christ, but not me seeing your suffering Christ in your sufferings. I haven't seen that in her. It seems to be quite a parallel with the choice of Israel in some places. Uh, Which I can't say too much about because I don't know too much about it. <laughs> Course. No, that's very true, and and um, I mean I think that one of the worst kinds of suffering that people go through is say mental, you know, ill 
bad mental health. So if you're in a if you're in a depression, you can suffer as much as if your children were dying and you were impoverished, but you can't explain to anyone. Nobody can see why you should be suffering like that, so it's kind of redoubled. Yeah. So in all kinds of ways, of course, the poor are not the only locus of suffering. Yeah, yeah. I Kafod took me to Rwanda last summer, and I got a certain amount of disgust from a Rwandan Jesuit saying, you know, you think we only have poverty here, but I've seen in in Boston when they close a parish, people die because they lose their human contact. You know, there's plenty of poverty in other kinds of ways. So of course, there's lots of there's lots of suffering. I think we were talking about the poor because Pope Francis talks about the poor. Um, yeah, so. Right. Suffering, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's interesting point about God's anger and um, well, your point about her point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Um, okay. So so yes. So this point about God's anger that's a very helpful point. You have to do a lot of work. That there seems to be a lot of biblical evidence for God's anger. So, first of all, you have Jesus' anger in the temple, but you also have quite a. Excuse me. His anger lasts but a moment. Yes. So you have you have a lot of um, biblical Old Testament language about God's anger, God's wrath. Um, now, she stands within a tradition that's already saying that a lot of that language is metaphorical. That there's a lot of things that are said about God that we have to take metaphorically because we, we just can't believe that God changes in time. Now, you, you might or might not want to accept that. Certainly, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of Protestant scholars who think that that's the imposition of Neoplatonic philosophy onto the Bible and it's unbiblical and we shouldn't take God out of time. But she's within a tradition that you'll, you'll get from Augustine that God is eternal, God isn't shifting, God isn't affected by things outside God so that, you know, today I'm happy but something sad happens so tomorrow I'm sad and then I recover the next day so that tradition has to interpret a lot of biblical language as expressing something about us or speaking metaphorically or you know some quite complex hermeneutics what that tradition would say about Jesus' anger in the temple Jesus is a human the humanity of Christ I suppose could feel different emotion and could be angry Exactly. Yeah. So it it is, it is um, a kind of. This is a position that you don't read too quickly off the Bible. It comes as a product of a lot of reflection on how do we understand the transcendence of God and how we do relate it to these biblical stories. But since our time is up, I'm using that as an excuse not to try to go into that (laughs) too much more. But are there any last questions or comments? Um, I, I suppose we don't know that. She doesn't say that. We don't know. Um, have to look at the dates. But the visions are happening when she has whatever it is, this mortal illness that she thinks she's going to die. It doesn't come across to me as though it's the plague because everyone is happy to be by her bedside and she doesn't say that lots of other people were dying at the same time. It seems to be very much an individual illness she has that everyone thinks she's about to die. But the visions do come when she's at her worst. I think I shouldn't hold you any longer from your tea, but thank you for putting up with uh, long, a long, lot of questions.